My guest, Justin Hayat, is associated with different organizations. He is experienced in the field of sustainable transportation and dedicated to delivering solutions for cities that seek greater environmental, social, and economical sustainability. His expertise is closely linked to his passion about how to make cities work better, how to support community resilience, how to get more people on bicycles, how to create beautiful and functional public spaces, and how to bring both an ecological and human dimension to planning. In this episode, we talked about his passion and the lessons from his work journey in different countries and different organizations, and we precisely focused on his association with Car Free Cities Alliance. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I am Azban Sari, the founder of the organization Peacemakers Pakistani, and I am bringing you the stories of placemakers, artists, and professionals from around the globe about how they created an impact and made change happen. You are listening to the Making It Happen show. Thank you for joining in. Enjoy the episode. Hello, Justin. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you and how's it going? Going fine. Thank you. Uh, doing, doing fine. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. I love your background and I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for saying yes to this interview. We have talked before and I'm so glad to have you on my show. I'm happy to be here as well. Great. Okay, so let's start with our question. So let's begin. I would like to know that how did you find your passion for making better public spaces and uh, planning in cities? Okay, yeah. Um happy to answer that. Uh, I would say that a lot of my um, uh, development, personal development and my education in that uh, came as a young adult after I graduated from uh, my undergrad university. So uh, basically what happened was uh, I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go with things. Uh, I studied in the humanities at my university. But I wasn't really thinking that I wanted to become a history professor or go, you know, for an extended uh, work in that. And I had had a number of friends from university who had been interested in e- ecology and in environmental uh, topics. And so when I started off my basically my working career, uh, I happened to be in the city of Budapest in Hungary at that time. Uh, my parents had been living there and I... Uh, after a number of visits, I just ended up staying there because I really liked it. So I ended up spending a lot of time in uh, in Hungary, and I made that my home uh, as a fresh out of college uh, person. And I soon got to uh, know a lot the people in the civil society there. Um, I, I did some work on media, and in fact, with um, a few people, we started uh, back in back in this period of time. Uh, th- this was before social media. There used to be this uh, independent media network. It was called Indie Media. And the whole point of Indie Media was to uh, report on a lot of the news that was being missed by the mainstream media. And so I helped uh, a number of people to set that up in the Hungarian context. So we made the Indie Media Hungary. And that was a, that was a fun experience. And that got me closer involved in the local civil society uh, network and organizations. And then later I joined another group, which was a social and environmental youth association. Uh, I spent a lot of time with them. And I just slowly and gradually became more and more interested and involved in questions about how cities function, how public space works, I was asking myself questions like, why are all the spaces uh, so dominated by cars? And why aren't they always, um, uh, why is it uh, like built like that? And couldn't there be some better ways? So basically, I think I just had a, um, uh, let's say, uh, a slow realization process of, how cities function and as i uh, mentioned i had been interested in environmental topics so i realized that an environmental approach or an ecological approach to uh, developing cities or to having cities uh, the functioning of cities and of the spaces in cities that it could be better and uh, 
I, I think I just realized that, yeah, um, what would be a better way? Of course, it would be with more people being able to cycle around or just other ways to use space. Um, and I would say I was very uh, lucky, I guess, that I happened to live in Budapest at the time when this uh, critical mass bicycle movement uh, started to happen. Uh, well, it, it had already started and happened in other places in the world. So uh, it, it started originally in San Francisco in the U.S., I would say by now something like 25 years ago. And then when I was in Budapest, the, the rides they picked up. Uh, I, I, in no way <laughs> do I want to say that I had anything to do with it uh, in actually getting them to happen. Although my organization, we did support them and I became involved in them as well. But I mean, these became huge rides with thousands and thousands of people joining them. And uh, at one point, the Budapest Critical Mass, we had the biggest critical mass rides with the biggest participation in the world. I mean, bigger than New York, bigger than San Francisco, bigger than a lot of other places that did critical mass bicycle rides. And those were hugely inspirational. And I got to uh, see how doing these kinds of things as a social participation tool or as a movement was really successful and that a lot of new people came to start uh, using the bicycle in, in Budapest. Like I, I was riding a bicycle um, and there were very few people early on. And yeah, you were, you were kind of a very rare uh, breed there in the city, not a lot of other people cycling. And then throughout this whole process of the critical mass bicycle rides, more and more people came to join it. And that, that was a really great experience. Uh, to, to be a part of it. I remember there were little like films being made about it and there was a lot of um, media coverage at the time. Uh, at one point I was actually contacted or got in touch with uh, the original uh, founders of Critical Mass in San Francisco. We exchanged materials. Uh, we've been in touch since then uh, as well. In fact, we, we even invited him on the, uh, the Car Free Cities Alliance on one of our webinars uh, Chris Carlson, he came and he presented at one of our webinars. So that was really nice. Um, so in all this period, I basically just came to, well, uh, think a lot about how cities function and how they work. I did my own research. I wrote a small book, if you can call it that, like a guidebook on, um, well, basically uh, sustainable urban mobility principles. Um, and that was also a really fun experience because I got to uh, distribute that in the region uh, where I live. So I, uh, living in Budapest, I, I went to other countries in the uh, eastern, southeastern European area like Bulgaria, to Turkey, and uh, they had the, the books translated. So I distributed them. I met with a lot of different organizations and cities uh, to discuss some of the, the topics involved in that. and sort of throughout this whole period, I just became more and more involved in the topic. And then at one point I realized that uh, that's all really good. And I was really happy to be a part uh, or, you know, to be working in this field, but because my background had been in the liberal arts uh, area, it's not really the same uh, thing. So then I decided to go ahead and um, get a master's degree closely related to the topic that I work on. So urban management and development, uh, which took me into the Netherlands where I did a degree in that. And well, that's then already going into a lot of different uh, directions. So uh, I'll just finish the your question at that and then happy to talk about any other uh, aspects of that. Great, uh, you have shared it uh, with so much detail, you know, and I can see that how you let things happen with the slow process and you were letting it all in and you were learning from it and then you were taking the next step like it wasn't all planned it was coming as it was coming to you and you were accepting it and i think uh, that's why when you talk you talk with so much depth and also you are able to understand things like uh last time we just had a talk and you were you were a great listener i was thinking I wanted to know that how did you get so much patience <laughs> and so much acceptance and now I know it. 
how so i'm so happy to know about it and uh, in indeed there's so much to learn from you so i look forward to do, doing that in the future as well okay so uh, like i've seen your great work in the car free cities alliance so i would like to know more about it what is your vision for that and what are your short term and long term goals so and how do you fit in like um different projects maybe or is it just you like your focus is only on the car free cities and how do you think like it covers all the aspects because it does it's it's sort of root cause of why people are not being able to use public spaces so how do you state that okay uh it's almost easier to uh say what the long term goals are uh just because uh, the long term goals of course uh we would love to wake up in a world where all of our cities are either car free or they're mostly uh, uh car free and pedestrian only or you know using bicycles uh public transportation things like that um yeah uh i mean that's it's a beautiful vision and i really do hope and believe that at least in some parts of the world hopefully lots of the world that the way that cities function can shift to uh much better places where they're not overrun by cars um because uh, cars are actually a very inefficient they're not they're not only um they don't only produce a lot of um uh, uh, carbon emissions and a lot of pollution but they're also a very inefficient uh way to get around i mean if you think about it lots of cars will be parked on the street for 23 out of 24 hours of the day. I mean they're just sitting there occupying space um taking up valuable uh you know urban real estate and it and then they're driving for a while they're stuck in traffic with all the other people who are using them for that exact period of time uh <laughs> emitting a lot of pollution and it just doesn't make any sense. It's just kind of like a, a very strange way like if you know aliens came down and they wanted to look at like how are humans organizing their cities they would be like that's kind of a weird way to organize transportation is having these things that make all this noise and all the all this pollution and then they're just sitting there for for most of the time while you have a lot of people pedestrians uh people on bicycles uh you know you have uh parents pushing wheel uh, uh sorry uh, uh pushing prams with their children in them or people on wheelchairs as well um kids who want to play and all of us are squeezed to the side when the car is just going everywhere uh so yeah so that doesn't really make a lot of sense and i think that a lot of people have woken up to see that that's not the most sustainable and the most intelligent way to design cities so uh myself and those in my organization the carpe cities alliance as well as i think many others uh you know we we hardly went to say that we're the only ones thinking or talking about this so there's a lot of people who have really come to this um uh, belief and uh would like to be a part of the movement that makes cities more sustainable and less car um uh, dominant or you know reduce the car culture or the we can even call it the car footprint of cities and so while my long term vision and hope is that uh we can get cities that are really largely on the side of car free or at least have a lot more car free spaces in them to, uh than they do today um i mean that is a long term goal and uh something that i always like to explain about the organization car free cities alliance is that we realize that we cannot just um you know wave a magic wand and we can't change everything tomorrow um and uh, of course any kind of a system that has been uh so strongly entrenched in how people go about their daily lives you know using cars that when social change needs to happen this is something that often doesn't happen that quickly so it's something that does take time it needs experimentation it needs um people being able to learn other ways of doing things so giving people the chance to to try things in different ways it's like for example when i told about the budapest critical mass and, and critical mass in other uh cities and countries uh you know just people being able to see for themselves on their own skin 
what it's like to do things differently has always been one of the best ways, you know, for, for that aha moment for to realize, hey, this actually this, this can work. And so what we hope to do with our organization is we just want to be able to put that out there, to put that vision out there to help and to promote the idea and the the fact that there are real alternatives that exist. There, there are a lot of uh, ways that we can, even today, work to make cities better, uh, work to change uh, some of the processes, uh, and, and particularly just open people's minds, how people are thinking about uh, cities and transportation and public space and uh, community and so forth. So uh, I would say a big goal right now is to become... Uh, let's say a mouthpiece for the car free movement and and also just for the sustainable um, cities movement for the uh, um, sustainable spaces um, yeah if we can uh, just bring the, the message and the understanding and the inspiration to more people around the world and also try to bring together some of the different people who are interested in this who are, are passionate about this or who want to uh, you know join us in basically working towards some of these goals then that's that's the more short-term uh, goal so um there are different things different ways that we want to do that uh right now we uh we're trying to uh, yeah, basically link up with other people other organizations uh we we run webinars. We'll have one coming up on the 16th of May. Um, and then we um, develop tools that we that we release and uh, there, there are very other, uh, various other ways that we're basically, yeah, trying to um, bring the basic ideas of what we're talking about to a greater audience. Amazing. Okay, so I wanted to ask you that, uh, uh, have you already founded Car Free City Alliance, the organization, when you were experiencing the bicycle culture in Hungary, Budapest. So have, uh, were, was it going side by side or did it came later? So it was at the time when I was there and when the critical mass movement started, uh, or at least started in Hungary, um, uh, where the Car Free movement actually uh, already existed i think it started around to be okay, to be precise i think it started in 1997 in lyon france uh and then basically it was uh, there was this organization it was the predecessor to the car free cities alliance so it was a, a, another organization called world car free network and this existed before and i got to know about it while i was living in budapest and you know, with the critical mass movement there and with my local organization, we uh, eventually got in touch with the car free, uh, with the World Car Free Network, which was then based in Prague in the Czech Republic. And so I had exposure to them uh, and I got to know about the car free movement through the World Car Free Network. Um, and yeah, so then I would say, yes, definitely it was happening parallel. Now the Car Free Cities Alliance, uh, a number of years later, it's basically following in the footsteps of the World Coffee Network, which is no longer active. So there was never an actual overlap of the two organizations. The World Coffee Network, it stopped being active at some point. And then with the Coffee Cities Lines, we picked up basically the pieces and, well, we, we adopted a new name and we have a slightly different, um, let's say, orientation. So, for example, one major difference is that we are a lot more present in uh, other parts of the world, so in Asia, in Africa, and other places, whereas the World Coffee Network was mainly uh, operating in Europe and North America. So we have, I would say, more of a global uh, reach in that way. And we have a lot of people also in South Asia who are interested in and uh, connected to what we do. But we follow really the, the same general idea and vision. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, just to put the the information out, a lot of uh, what we have done in the past, or a lot of the ideas of the Car Free Cities Alliance, and before that, the World Car Free Network, um, is based on the work of 
uh, Joel Crawford with uh, his books, Car Free Cities and Car Free Design Manual. So he uh, is one of the early, um, let's call him pioneer of car free cities. And he put out a full explanation uh, in two different books on what car free cities are, how to create them, what they look like, what are important components about them. Um, and yeah, they're really, uh, I would say it's really strong and uh, incredibly also inviting, um, let's say, treatise on what car free cities are. And uh, just as a side note, uh, we do have a number of these books that we try to make available to, to people who are interested in them. So hopefully we can get a copy to you at some point. Thank you so much. Uh, great. And, you know, I'm, um, it's a great content. Like I visited the site and it has been amazing. And the way uh, you try to uh, connect us with the cause and it's amazing. And I'm looking forward to more that's coming from our side and we'll keep it a bit surprise for people for now. <laughs> but I look forward to that. Okay. So I also want to know that you have lived in different countries, right? Um, would you like to share any few small scale projects that you have seen with a greater impact? Would you like to share them so we can see that the importance of small scale projects is more and it's not only the big scale projects that can bring some change? Sure. Um, so if you see the background uh, behind me in this picture, uh, it's taken from Tunisia, uh, where I did live for a short period of time for about a year and a half. And uh, I was a part of a project which I really enjoyed. It was a leadership project for uh, working with young people uh, who want to uh, be a part of their local development in, in their city. And it was a project that was funded by the Polish government. So it was a Polish Tunisian uh, production uh, project. And yeah, I was able to be part of that. And what yeah, it was just really nice because it <clears throat> opened up the opportunity to work with a lot of young people in the city that I was living in then. It was in Sousse in Tunisia. And I got to meet a lot of young, uh, yeah, young people who were mostly university students, um, a lot of them engineering students. And uh, we had a whole series of programs that they could be a part of. So we had workshops and we had uh, guests, uh, visiting guest lecturers from outside of the country who would come in. And we did common projects together, like putting newspapers together, creating small, uh, small scale projects, like you mentioned. We had the, they were called I think we called the mini projects, which we gave some uh, funds to be able to carry them out. Uh, I mean, it include and in the like in one place it was uh, doing some restoration in a local park in the city, like a city park. Uh, in another place, it was uh, at the beach. It was painting. Uh, some parts of the, the walkway down to the beach. Uh, there was also some painting of stairs in one of the communities there in the area. And uh, yeah, it was really, uh, like for me, what I really liked about the project was that, and while this is not specifically about, uh, you know, mobility or urban space, although that was included in some ways, but what was just really nice was that it was a project where, uh, basically, young people were able to um, really try and and sort of and like enlarge their perspective on their ability to be actively involved in their community and in the future of their country. And I had a lot of people tell me that they really loved and appreciated the project because it opened their eyes to ways that they could be involved, ways that they could be active, you know, that they could make a difference and things like that. And so uh, that, that kind of inspiration, I think is really, uh, yeah, very important, a very um, uh, it personally inspiring for me because it's always really uh, nice to see that, that people uh, not only appreciate, but really benefit from a project and are able to, basically just able to bring them further. So that was really nice. Um, so I think that's that's one uh, yeah, one example of a kind of a project like that that I can mention. Great. Okay, so um, 
since we have a short time for this and i think uh, the questions that i've prepared for you were solely for you these were the and now we can talk about the questions that i ask everyone and we can you know get to know more about you and it brings more soul uh, you know the personality or the person souls to the talk and i love asking them these questions okay so i would like to know that what keeps you what drives you what keeps you focused on your work okay uh good question um well i would have first of all i have i have to say that i feel my myself to be really lucky and fortunate that uh, my main interest and my main passion it's also the work that i can do as my regular job so um at least for for now i don't have to do another job just to earn money and then do the job that i really believe in like in the evening or something so i can do my regular job uh that is yeah thankfully funded and i can do that during the daytime so it's my regular job um and you know like when you work in this sphere so I, I, um, how to call it it's the um yeah it's a nonprofit sector it's in the field of urban planning urban development uh in the field of um uh yeah mobility urban uh transportation things like that so it's it's quite an interesting and also very broad field and there's almost like an unlimited number of different ways that things can go so there's so many different things that you can do there's a lot of room for creativity which i really enjoy uh it can be overwhelming sometimes i'll i'll admit it just because i mean you know there's just almost like an endless number of different things that you could uh ways that you could uh be involved or be impactful i mean for example we have one person in the organization who works on the social media side i haven't been that much involved there although i've dabbled in that a bit in the past uh you know i i said that we do webinars i also one thing that i i like is writing and so sometimes we'll write articles or um also we have a newsletter that we put together um and then we have a lot of different consultations with other organizations and different reach out so you know and then beyond that you know i i do enjoy going to actual conferences and meetings and you know being face to face with people um so there's just a lot of different things that you can do and that's uh yeah that's just still like basically starting uh, i mean some of the the things that i find really interesting are when we're discussing and brainstorming with a team that is like you know literally working on the ground on uh real world projects so you know we had we had this uh last year we had a um a few different meetings with a team based in uh in Pune in India and they are working hard in their city to develop a pedestrian zone in their downtown and they they want to make a car free zone and we had a number of consultations with them and so, some of our different um partners and just the discussions and like trying to think about and understand the issues uh brainstorming on what are some different approaches that can be used i mean something like that is just very uh yeah very inspiring because you know that you're very close to action that's happening and if you and the people that you work with are able to make impact and able to uh affect you know what's happening on the ground i mean that's just uh i mean that's just really rewarding because uh you know it's basically your own um involvement can can help to change something and so that i think i would say that's that's often been what i've really felt that that i enjoy and that i hope in the future will be you know even more and more uh you know as time goes on there's always more and more opportunities that uh, that open up and when you're able to uh be a part of projects that can have uh real meaningful impact uh on the ground and you know help to change a situation that's that's what i find really nice uh, i can give another just small example i was recently at a meeting in vienna austria and um i'm not sure if you're aware there's a particular type of um 
like street and neighborhood transformation called Superblocks. It was uh, originated in Barcelona. And the idea is that you have like basically a, a block of, uh, let's say, um, maybe uh, two or three streets, like one way and then two or three streets another way. So you have like a block of maybe nine different like neighborhood sort of uh, blocks, if you can put it that way. And uh, the way that these, the super block uh, idea works is that it converts the spaces uh, in, inside that area for people to have space to play. Um, you know, it, it basically, it uh, removes, uh, for the most part at least, the parking. It changes through streets. To, you can only, as a resident, like drive in a circle basically, but you can't just like speed through there. Um, so long story short, I was at a meeting in Vienna where we looked at a new super block that was uh, uh, initiated in one of the neighborhoods there in Vienna. And we got to have a tour of it. Um, I got to spend some time with the main person who organized the whole project and who got it really to, to come off the ground. And it's just really great to see, uh, you know, we were, we were there. Uh, I can, I have pictures, I can send them to you. Uh, we were there looking at the spaces that, that were created and they said, yeah, it's been a huge difference. Like, you know, a few months before this happened, you would have just cars and motorbikes all speeding past, uh, a lot of noise and, and all that has changed. Now it's calm and quiet. Uh, you have a lot more uh, kids who are playing there. And th th that's the kind of inspiration that I really appreciate. So I, ho I hope that answers the question. I know it was a bit of a roundabout way to explain it, but um yeah, what, what inspires me is just being a part of these initiatives when you can see that they, they make a real difference in people's lives and goes in the direction uh, that's a part of our vision uh, for yeah, healthier, more livable cities. Great, that's relatable. Okay, so since you are so positive and covering all the positive, positive aspects, I would like to know that what was your hardest moment of work life and what did you learn from that? Ooh, okay, that's a good question. Uh, it's the hardest moment of work life. Uh huh. Mm, I would have to think about that for a moment. Um, yeah, good question. Good question. Uh, um, I would say, yeah, it's it's not so much. Okay, I would say that the a person's like emotions and and thoughts how they connect to uh, their work and their life and what they're doing it's a little bit like a roller coaster so it's not so much that um i have like one moment or like one thing which was like really difficult i mean i could probably mention some, some more difficult periods uh in my work and uh like complications and things like that but like what it, what i realize is that uh, a lot of times in the work that I do, or and this is probably, I think, true for a lot of people. So sometimes it's just, uh, yeah, it's it's like you're you're on a you're on a slump. You're in sort of in the down uh, place where you get really frustrated and you're not sure that what you're doing really has any meaning. Is it making any impact? Yeah, uh, you kind of ask yourself, okay what is the point of this? Am I, am I really like in the right place? Am I doing the right thing? Should I be doing something else? So you have these moments and uh, that's a part of like the roller coaster when you're down, but then you bounce back up and you have like the, 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 the times when you're like, yeah, you know, th things are actually happening. So a lot of the times uh, I would say, yeah, like uh, I feel that the work that I'm doing um, and, you know, basically my career tra trajectory and a lot of the things uh, with, with my organization and so forth, that, yeah, it's, it's really meaningful. Uh, it's really important. And I, I'm really happy that I'm doing this work and that I'm a part of that. Um, and I also believe that, you know, as, as we go forward, there will always, I mean, that there is, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the idea, like, you know, the, the best, times are still to come. So there's always, there, there's going to be like even bigger and better things happening. 
I mean, it's an exciting field to be in, I believe, but it's not li a linear progression. So sometimes you, it's like you, you sort of, you lose your, your sense of where you are and you feel frustrated or you feel like, okay, some, so, sometimes some things just don't work and you have to try it a bit differently. Um, so I would say it's a lot of really like up and down in that sense. Um, and yeah, fortunately there are a lot of good times and there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, periods where you're actually, you're up and where you just carry that feeling with you that yes, this is, uh, um, yeah, this is the right thing to do and you're doing your best and you have a mission. And so that's really good. Um, and then you just know that, okay, when things are at least seemingly aren't, aren't going so well at some times, or you're not really sure what you're doing at some point. Well, you know, that's just a part of the whole trip. And, uh, so yeah, so I, I would, I would put it that way. And, uh, I'm definitely happy to be on this ride, even if it's not linear and straightforward, but it's brought lots of really, I think, great moments. And it's also enabled me to meet, I think a, a lot of really amazing people around the world, which is also, I think one of the big benefits and one of the, the special parts of it. Awesome. You know, your answer has been such a great advice in itself like it was uh, a lesson from your lifetime experience and what you are continuing to do i think i should not ask you about any advice that you have for the youngsters i will think we'll wrap up with this this answer that this is the advice that is from you to all of us because i take it as an advice for myself because i'm experiencing it the ups and downs and then how it's not linear and I just have to remind myself, be patient, enjoy what's there, the joyful parts. And again, you didn't share your hardest moment exactly because you were sharing the lessons from it. And that's something I loved about your personality from the get go. So I if you want to, I can just add uh, the, the word you mentioned there was really a key one, important one, patience. And that's that's something which I think, I, OK, you asked me, where did I get it? I, I also don't know. I. I guess I happen to be uh, fairly patient. I try to be patient. Maybe I got it from my parents. Uh, maybe I got it from, I don't know, the water Bradley. and the <laughs> pipes or whatever when I was growing up. I'm not sure. But yeah, I think that being patient is really important. And one of the, okay, I would say uh, if you ask for any specific thing, I mean, when I was at university doing my master's, I'll try to cut a long story short, but like the, I did my master's thesis and I had a, a thesis supervisor. He really liked my work. And uh, I, I had been this like second reader and sort of like there's this system in the university where they give it to different people. And then there was somebody who had like problems with it. Uh, I, in, I ended up having to rewrite it. Uh, I ended up rewriting my thesis uh, like two times over a, a few years period. And at some points, you know, I mean, the thesis can be quite long and it's related to your, uh, your fields, field work. And at some point I was thinking, ah, this is like never going to end because like, I kept having to do new things to it and, you know, write new parts. And I mean, in the end, yeah, uh, my rewrites, it made my thesis stronger. And I think it, it turned out to be quite good and the results were, were good. So I was really happy with that, but in the, in the process in the period and especially because i had to also do my work and my like daily life and then try to do my thesis also and so it was just kind of like ah and i you know when's it ever going to end and i realized okay i just have to be patient because if you're patient then it will come um in a, in a good way in the future and so yeah just having that patience i think uh is important and has helped me uh, also in other areas realizing that if you want to see good results then you you shouldn't ask for them tomorrow on a silver platter um so yeah i think that's that's a, a good a good word that you threw in there yeah it's a great example and a, and totally relatable and also very inspiring as you know summarize summarizing it in a manner because you learn from it so it's a lesson for us and i'm truly grateful for it Thank you so much, Justin, for your time and for the amazing lessons you shared by sharing your journey because um, it's versatile. Like I say, it's versatile in itself. 
and it's truly inspiring. You're a great leader. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing it with us. Well, thank you too. Thank you for your questions and for your conversation with me. I, I also really enjoyed it. And uh, like I said, I'm happy to continue in whatever uh, shape or form. So I'll, I'll let you lead on that and uh, look forward to happy the next to do conversation. So. And, uh, actually, I'm honored to do so. Thank you so much. Let's stay okay. and see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome. Okay.